This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Hawaii. When we think of Hawaii, we think of paradise. Coral sand beaches, coconut palms gently swaying in the ocean breeze, waterfalls, rainbows. Hawaii is all these things and many more. In fact, Hawaii has a deep, dark little secret. A secret the U.S. government wouldn't like you to know about. the American agenda tonight, a most significant presidential apology. At the White House yesterday, President Clinton signed a formal letter of apology to the people of Hawaii. He was apologizing on behalf of the U.S. government for the government's involvement a hundred years ago in removing the independent Hawaiian monarchy by force. And on the agenda tonight, Hawaiian identity. Native Hawaiians who say, give us back our country. In Hawaii, hundreds of people demonstrate and a president apologizes. The reason? The United States government that considers Hawaii the 50th state of the Union has in fact admitted that a century ago it committed an abuse. In 1993, the U.S. government passed a law. This was approved by the Congress, the Senate, and ultimately signed into law by President Clinton. And this was a confession, flat out. Public Law 103-150 was a confession. And in that confession, the United States admitted to all sorts of crimes, and it further admitted that the Hawaiian nation never relinquished its rights. But if Hawaii is the 50th state of the Union since 1959, why is it that in 1993, President Bill Clinton apologized for the usurpation the original inhabitants of the archipelago were victims of. To understand this situation, let's do some history. Hawaii is an archipelago formed by eight islands, situated in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. They were probably populated by immigrants from faraway lands. They created a socially and politically advanced society. Native Hawaiians are Polynesians. They come from a land they call Kahiki, which is the homeland, and many believe that to be Tahiti or the Marquesas. And perhaps we're here as early as 100 BC, um, perhaps a little bit later than that. Um, Two-way voyaging continued uh, for many centuries, and then by about the 12th or 13th century, um, Hawaiians were living here pretty much on their own and developing a, a much more stratified society. Um, and that led to the, the development of different island kingdoms here amongst the chain. So you had an, uh, rather a kingdom of Kauai, a kingdom of Oahu, kingdom of Maui, and of Hawaii Island. Its founding king, Kamehameha the Great, unified the societies of the archipelago. Their soil began to yield food for the inhabitants of Hawaii. However, the Hawaiian kingdom would not be alone for long. By the same sea from where the original inhabitants of Hawaii came from, visitors from other lands would arrive. If you love history, then you will love History Hit. 
Our extensive library of documentary features everything from the ancient origins of our earliest ancestors to the daring mission to sink the Bismarck. History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. Contact with foreigners of European or American descent comes in 1778 with the arrival of Captain Cook. It is speculated that there may have been other encounters prior to that, but it's not documented. Captain James Cook, a British explorer and sailor, established contact with the inhabitants of Hawaii. In 1794, the British explorer George Vancouver gave the court of King Kamehameha a Union Jack as a token of friendship from King George III. The Hawaiian Kingdom added the Union Jack to its own flag as an act of recognition for the gesture of British friendship. In spite of the foreign presence in Hawaii, mainly Britain at the time, as well as other ethnic groups, King Kamehameha gave his kingdom its own identity. He gained international recognition. 1843, the Kingdom of Hawaii was indeed recognized as an independent nation state, as a member of the family of nations, through treaties with the United States, Great Britain, and France, and, and I believe about 20 other nations of Europe. And this was meant to secure the sovereignty of the nation through those treaty agreements that were then made. And so from that point on, 1843, the Kingdom of Hawaii is indeed recognized as an independent nation-state. As the monarch consolidated the archipelago as a sovereign state, the Kingdom of Hawaii also created a society of citizens with its own identity, an independent state. In the 19th century, um, the term Hawaiian was an indicator of, of citizenship or membership to the Hawaiian Kingdom. Uh, which throughout the 19th century was an independent country, independent state. Uh, beginning in 1843, the Hawaiian Kingdom was actually the first non-European territory uh, in the world to become an independent and recognized uh, uh, state. As a sign of recognition of Hawaii's independence, several members of the Hawaiian royal family travel all over the world on official visits. They were welcomed by kingdoms and republics as the true representatives of a sovereign kingdom. In the meantime, Western immigrants continued to arrive in Hawaii. By the start of the 19th century, a few American settlers were already living in the archipelago. So as the, the American settler population continued to grow, um, there began, and their interest in business continued to grow, they oftentimes uh, were pressuring the monarchs um, pressuring the government to uh, to develop things, or to, to, for the government to develop and the economy to develop in a way that these settlers uh, would find most comfortable. A group of settlers, mainly American, formed an organization of landowners. They controlled the production of sugarcane. Their economic power ensured that their influence in the affairs of the kingdom increased. So when we get to 1893, by that time, these foreign settlers, many of them who were invested in the plantation economy, were, were very strong in their opinions about how the government should continue. And when Liliu Okalani, who was the Queen of Hawaii in 1893, when she proposed to bring forward a new constitution, uh, a, a group of 13 businessmen calling themselves the Annexation Club uh, and the Committee of Safety, uh, they took it upon themselves to overthrow the Queen or to remove her uh, from the government. And they did this in conjunction or with the approval, it would seem, of the U.S. Minister to the Hawaiian Kingdom, Minister Stevens. And so he was totally misrepresenting his position by essentially conspiring with this group to take over the Queen's government. 
In the constitution, Queen Liliuokalani only gave the right to vote to those citizens who were considered natives of Hawaii. The settlers feared that they may lose their political and economic power. On the 17th of January 1893, US troops landed in Hawaii, arguing that they were there to protect the rights of the settlers. Queen Liliuokalani was arrested and taken to the royal palace of Lolani. She was forced to abdicate because of the military superiority of the invaders. The conspirators took advantage of the end of the monarchy to take control of the archipelago. They created the so-called Republic of Hawaii. However, the inhabitants of the islands did not accept such imposition and took action. This is when the people of Hawaii gather together in a couple of huis or groups um, that protest against annexations with a petition asking uh, that the United States recognize that the people of Hawaii who have signed this petition do not want to be a part of the United States, do not wish to be annexed. And we believe that some 38,000 people in total signed these petitions out of a Native Hawaiian population that was close to 40,000. The petition did not succeed. On the 12th of August, 1898, in a ceremony that took place in front of the Lalani Palace, the old residence of the Hawaiian monarchs, the flag of the kingdom was taken down, an American flag was raised. The annexation of Hawaii brought a process of Americanization in the local society. This process included the imposition of an educational system that marginalized the values of the local population. The local language was replaced by that of the settlers. In 1896, under the authority of the Republic of Hawaii, a law was passed that stated that all public school instruction must take place in English. So they didn't outright ban Hawaiian, but in effect they did, because they said to everyone, you must learn English, you must use English, and only English in your schools. And so parents became much more reluctant to use Hawaiian language in their homes. And certainly in the schools, many children were reprimanded for using Hawaiian language when they were expected to be using English. It's when the U.S. took over our education. There, it went, they took our language. They took our land. They took our identity. And they nearly succeeded in taking our will to live. At the same time, the United States passed a law which determined who was and who was not a Hawaiian. Around 1920, uh, you start to see this legislation um, being passed in U.S. Congress that kind of begins to define legally through U.S. law what is considered a Native Hawaiian. In that bill, U.S. congressional law, you have um, for the first time this understanding of blood quantum that Native Hawaiians, right, are legally defined as those that possess um, um, half native blood, right, or 50% native blood. So you can really start to see American racial logic being institutionalized within, um, within Hawaii. And that, that, that lasts for a very long time, even till, the, even till this day, right, these terms, native Hawaiian or Hawaiian, are now defined um, through U.S. law within the context of blood quantum. One turn a second of drop is still Hawaiian. But they say, oh, according to their law, you have to have 50%. That's bullhead. Hey, they can get lost. We don't need them coming over here and telling us what to do and what not to do. So, as far as blood quantum is concerned, I'd say they commit in genocide. Big time, big time. This process of Americanization and the imposition of rules that were alien to the local culture led to the violation of native sacred land. 
uh, that place they call uh, Walmart on Kiamoku Street and Makaloa Street. It just happened that my family had the ownership papers to uh, eight and a half acres. And that's where they put their, uh, their store on. They found 66 sets of bones that were buried on that, on that property grounds. And it took seven years to get through all the mitigations and all whatever for us to put the bones back in the ground. And all we're trying to do is respect our own ancestors. And you know what would be really interesting? If some of us went up to Punch Bowl, where the, uh, the, the, the American veterans are buried, and go up there and tear out some of those graves and put up a fancy building. The United States did not settle for the annexation of Hawaii, the suppression of the local language and the desecration of hallowed lands. They wanted statehood. They wanted to turn Hawaii into a new state of the Union. On the 12th of March, 1959, the US Congress overwhelmingly voted in favor of statehood. So Hawaii became the 50th state of the Union. It's made official at the White House. President Eisenhower congratulates the new congressional representatives of Hawaii before the simple ceremonies that remake the geography of the United States, adding the 50th and southernmost state with a land area of six and a half thousand miles and a population of 600,000. Hawaii becomes a state of the United States in 1959. Of course, if, if annexation were or was illegal and overthrow was illegal, then many believe statehood uh, is also an illegal event. Uh, so you, do, you certainly continue to have debate here in Hawaii as to whether or not Hawaii is a state. But officially, um, according to the United States in 1959. It is not surprising then that President Bill Clinton sanctioned a law whereby his government apologized for the dispossession the local population had been victims of. The law recognized that the people of Hawaii had not voluntarily relinquished their rights, nor had they accepted the abolition of their kingdom. You, you don't need to be a lawyer, really to understand. If the criminal admits to committing a crime against you and further admits that you never relinquished your rights, i.e. your property was stolen and you never relinquished your rights to the property, you don't need to be a lawyer to understand that according to them, that the Hawaiians have one of the best claims, if not the best claim, for independence once again. So that bill um, um, really should have apologized to um, the national population. But that wordage of saying national population would would kind of throw off, right, the, the political intent of that bill to kind of sidestep, right, or kind of erase that, hist that history that it was a kingdom. Why did the Americans do it? That was the first question I asked when I heard about the apology bill. It was an intent to defraud the Hawaiian nation, the Hawaiian people even further. The apology bill was followed by several resolutions proposed by a senator for Hawaii, Daniel Akaka, to be implemented by the year 2000. His intention was to pass a law that would give Native Hawaiians federal recognition. The same strategy was used for the Native Americans. In 2009, Congress passed the so-called Native Hawaiian Government Reorganization Act, also known as the Akaka Law. According to this law, the descendants of the original inhabitants of the archipelago could form a government but within the U.S. federal structure. They could not reclaim the rights they had lost before the overthrow of the monarchy in 1893 or their status of sovereign nation. And I believe the people that were involved in the Yakaka Bill that's trying to continue to deprive us were absolutely on the track of imposterating our claims. And, and, and at the end of it all, first of all, naming us Native Hawaiians, which, which we're not Native, we, we, we're nationals. Okay? So imposteration started, not knowing this. Then the imposteration for Native Hawaiians were coming. And then the next step would be that the imposteration was that they now becoming the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Asian Foundation. And, and most of our people don't know this yet. We're on a different boat here. A lot of people like to compare us with the American Indian, per se. Well, in our, in our situation, we're fortunate enough to have a government 
that actually had the treaties with the U.S. that actually have never been dissolved. So, you know, um, if anything, it'll show America's true colors if they want to be a good big brother or not. For more than a century, the United States has been working to establish the image of Hawaii as a tourist destination. Behind a facade of paradise hides a history of usurpation and dispossession. This history has given rise to several pro-sovereignty movements which have demanded their right to be an independent nation. Remember all the stolen lands, this Hawaiian Superman is wanting it back. Give back the land, Captain America. Give back the land, Captain America. Give back the land, Captain America. It's all right. Give back it's the land. Right. Governed by your policies, all we want is sovereignty. It's so hard to pay rent. This is for the auntie sleeping under palm trees and living in tents. It's a shame, Hawaiian. Pro sovereignty movement activists have started a process to recover their language and art. At the same time, universities are researching the history of Hawaii by dusting up old newspapers from the 19th century, all written in the local language. The Apology Bill strengthened the pro-sovereignty movements. They started to explore the possibility to recover their own government, the one that was in place before the annexation to the US in 1893. The lawful Hawaiian government is part of that process. My name is Henry Noor. Okay, I'm the elected prime minister for the reinstated lawful Hawaiian government. The lawful Hawaiian government was formed March 13, 1999 and it actually reinstated the former government offices that was in existence prior to January 17, 1893, the day that we got overthrown, our government was overthrown. So what has happened since that day till now is that basically there was actions taken by the, by the conspirators who are the United States government to try to justify or even validate their actual existence here and their authority that they exercise here in Hawaii. The lawful Hawaiian government, which has been in place for more than a decade, is not legally recognized by the United States. However, it is not simply a symbolic gesture of sovereignty, but it has its own structure it legislates and governs on the basis of strict rules. We have a House of Nobles, a House of Representatives, and an executive branch, which includes um, Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of the Interior, and the Minister of the Treasury. Uh, currently, we are engaging in land reclamations. We realize that we would have to be able to get our people yeah, to unite under this government. So we've done a lot of educational programs to get these, to get our own people to understand. Listen, the government still exists. It, it, it's been in abeyance. It's, it's been absent all these years. All we needed to do was put it back, bring back the government, which is what we are able to accomplish. The second thing that we educate our people to is now we need to put power to the government. And the only way that can happen is if we as a people participate in that government and begin to, de to build the government, the functional bodies of that government, the executive, the legislative, the judicial branches, all of the departments that come to function a government has to be, re has to be reset, of which we have actually accomplished those things. 
In its annual convention, known in the local language as Manukau Kanawai, the lawful Hawaiian government and delegates from all the islands got together to discuss issues related to land devolution, the structure of its government, and to appoint new authorities. In January 1893, our government was removed. On March 13, 1999, we, the Kanakamoli people from across the entire island chain, came together on Oahu, island of Oahu, and we initiated a process to reinstate the former offices of that government. It's been a long process, so from my understanding, the Hawaiian government has actually, the reinstated lawful Hawaiian government, has progressed to a point where now um, things are going to start to um, become, um, uh, it would come to exist. Who gave us that right? It's inherent in every Kanaka Maoli, and it's an obligation on that individual's part to fix an injustice to understand who you are and you have the perfect right to step forward and try to fulfill that obligation. We've been talking about how we're going to do things, but now we're applying ideas that we've been bringing up at the table at the Monaco Kanavais for the last 38 conventions, and it's going to pan out pretty good, I think. It's been a long time coming to get to this point where we're at today where we can actually reclaim land and issue awards. Um, we did a lot of preparations to get to this point and now that we're actually here, it's, uh, it's a little overwhelming, uh, exciting. Um, we have built a case that it's hard to argue with, you know, so and we know we're dealing with the de facto government. <clears throat> backed by the United States, and so we're up against some heavy hitters, we know that. So our case has to be solid. There has never been a time that I know in our history that we, not have, we have not worked to regain what is rightfully ours. Say this, to all those that have dedicated their time. Mahalo. Because you cannot get a nation if you don't put the work into it. We're at, we're at that stage where tomorrow, I believe, and this weekend, we're going to take some historical steps. legislated uh, resolutions in our Constitution. We brought our Constitution to modernity from 1893 yeah, and brought it forward to modernize it. That was archaic. A lot of the language was archaic. We had to modernize it, first of all, so we did as little as possible. That's another thing that happened, was that uh, the legislators who were elected were charged with uh, creating a constitutional convention in the year 2000. One, to modernize the constitution, and two, really, to really decide what style of government yeah, to implement. The lawful Hawaiian government's legislative branch is divided into seven districts, each one has a representative and a noble, according to the ancient traditions of the archipelago. In this branch, young and old take part without distinction. That's the way I look at it is being ahead of the curve, in a sense. You know, there are a few other members of the government itself that may be my age or younger. However, I guess what it comes down to is, well, having been called old for my age for some time, I guess 
I know there's a lot of folks my age who have a basic understanding of the issue. I mean, I guess, I guess in a sense, I find myself ahead of the curve in comprehending the moral obligation that accompanies, you know, the historic facts. Now you're going to see more of our generation getting involved with Olelo Hawaii and moving our culture and getting involved with the politics, um, just in different pathways, I think. And then on the flip side, I think outside of the Native Hawaiians within our education and how they view us, it, it has become more of a sport, I think. And Hawaii is just a, it's a cool place to come and work for two years and get their, get their thrills and then they move on. Kind of. Why I'm doing what I'm doing here today, and this is the most, this is the day we waited for a long, long time, and we've always uh, said it only on God's time will we we do this. Well, today is God's time, where we're gonna put the people back on the land. In this very spot, 13 years ago, Uncle Robert and I sat in his car, and we asked God to help us. And the rest, our prime minister at that time was the uh, uh, organizer of our, our hui. Everybody was waiting for us to bring one kanaka to that meeting. This is when we was gonna put the government together. And we ask God, right here at this very spot where we sit, help us, help us. You know, why am I so elated today? So in Hawaiian, we say the word for being elated is haole, haole nui, happy, very, very happy, uh, because we're getting to put our people back on the land that the U.S. had come through the sheep, you know, whatever you call it, uh, took our people and drove us to be destitute. And the problem that we're having is that they're not fulfilling their obligation. They're continuing to ignore, deny us. And that's one of the most difficult things when we're the victims of this hypocrisy, but the people on the payroll continue denying us access to our lands that they say they gave us all back, which we never received yet, to the monies that they say they've given us, we don't even receive. And this has been going on for 120 years. Hawaiian nationals know that there is a process that we're we're conducting or we're providing to reclaim lands, national lands. During the lawful Hawaiian government's convention, Prime Minister Henry Noah gave land titles to groups of 10 people. For them, that simple ceremony means the beginning of a new chapter in their lives because such land is situated in an area affected by volcanic activity. In fact, it does not belong to anyone. It is barren land where 10 settlers and their families will build up their future. Yes, sir, no man change your plans. Don't want to be a fireman. I want to get Demonstrate to them that this is our claim to our, our land and that we decide what happens on our land. Yes. Right. Yeah. Again, one, two, three, oh, one, two, three. Yeah. Now I got a second chance. Well, now we have a case, a land. So instead of going far up the hill, miles away from home, now we can just 
walk out here and home. E te mea te hau muoro. Ane o tote atu no te hapa tauturi a tato te itaime. Maururu, maururu ro. Amen. Amen. Well, this this one lot, this is for the, the community center where the community can meet. You know, you can come and have the kupuna, the, old, the elders do crafts, have the younger ones learn etiquette, you know, Hawaiian etiquette, learn how to make medicines, learn how to, how to do medical techniques, learn language skills, and you know, every, anything that the community needs, any kind of education as a whole, they can come to this hot spot. And then of course, tourists who are walking through, they can always visit. Anybody who like wants to know, they're welcome to come. One of the activities of the lawful Hawaiian government is poverty relief. Hawaii's image of prosperity with its luxurious shops and expensive cars in the most expensive state of the United States exists in stark contrast with the poverty in which hundreds of people live. The 2010 census found that 33% of families with children under five years of age live in a state of poverty. The postcard image of Hawaii contradicts the everyday reality of the inhabitants of the archipelago. What you see here around me is a homeless village that was established in um, 2009. Uh, this is adjacent to Waianae uh, Pokai Bay Boat Harbor. The boat harbor is right here. This campsite is right here. What these people have been able to do is stay out of the public parks, which their presence in occupying public parks seems to interfere with the tourists. And the government does not like interference with cash flow in any sort. Um, so this area here is called Pokai Bay. Um, and, and we're going into the four, uh, bushes adjacent to the, to the harbor. Uh, and this, I heard that this is where a mo majority of the homeless people that got ousted from the beaches have relocated to this area here. We have a, a history of these homeless people. Uh, been in, it has been increasing large numbers. I came here in 2010. In 2009 is actually when we became houseless. Uh, I will not say homeless because we are not homeless. We, Hawaii is our home, this Aina is our home. Uh, we became houseless in 2009. As a greenhorn addict, only knew how to go camping, and that's what I took. And from there, we kind of we we um, hit recession back in 2009. Uh, seven incomes, five loss, couldn't continue our home. Gave up our home back then. We began living amongst the uh, houseless people, and we learned a lot. And then from there, we got swept in uh, at Ulihava uh, back in March 2010. Most of these people that's here, started from here, from this camp going that way, have been here for a while. Where this tree is, right here, this berry tree is, yeah. um, there's an opai lua in there, but they're cleaning up. They're trying to clean up and stuff, yeah. A lot of us are, we understand um, that we are going to get swept, so a lot of us are doing spring cleaning right now. <laughs> so the people who come down and do the sweep and sweep everybody out of here, is it? Is that police department or the sheriff's department? Um, basically, what happens? Yeah, basically, what happens is okay. The st from what we understand and what was told to me was that the state is not in the business to do sweeps, but the state will go ahead because of the lease. They have to go ahead and do a lot of the um, what is required by law, which mm. is to clean out the land before they lease it. Right now, if they were to sweep us, nobody has nowhere to go. We don't know where to go. The next where? Moka. To the, to the mountains. But the denial of their rights 
the poverty and the marginalization under which they live are not the only problems faced by Hawaiians. There is a threat that hangs above their heads that puts in jeopardy their very existence. War. For the United States, Hawaii has not only been an archipelago with commercial and economic interests, these islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean are part of its strategic military structure. On August 16, 1898, four days after Hawaii became a part of our nation, the United States Army became an important part of the island community. Since then, under the impact of two world wars and the Korean conflict, the Army in Hawaii has expanded enormously. Today, the Hawaiian Islands represent a multi-million dollar base of operations for American defense forces in the Pacific Ocean area. In fact, the United States discovered the strategic and military importance of Hawaii long before its settlers managed to get it annexed in 1893. Major General John Schofield arrived on Oahu in 1872. His mission was to find a military use for the island's seaports. General Schofield found the seaports were perfect for the growing United States Navy and that the land between the Waianae and Ko'olau mountain ranges was ideal for ground forces. The American-Spanish War for the control of Puerto Rico, Guam and the Philippines sped up the annexation. For the Americans, Hawaii was a crucial stronghold for his military campaign. Pearl Harbor, built in 1900, became the main United States naval base in the Pacific. During the Second World War, on the morning of the 7th of December 1941, the Japanese Air Force exposed the vulnerability of Hawaii. I was uh, uh, nine years old when the uh, Pearl Harbor uh, happened, when Japan came by and uh, uh, bombed Pearl Harbor. That was uh, a very uh, memorable day for me, particularly. Uh, I didn't find out the destruction after everything was said and done. Uh, where uh, when I went home to my grandparents' home, I seen all the holes in the roof where the planes came over and strafed. The United States military presence in Hawaii constitutes a constant danger for the very existence of the archipelago. Hawaii is a military outpost. It's got every branch of the US military, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and there are unknown amounts of nuclear weapons. You've got nuclear submarines, you've got nuclear aircraft carriers, you've got nuclear silos with intercontinental ballistic missiles. Those missiles are directed at targets all around the world. There are literally billions of people under threat from the missiles that are based here in Hawaii. Literally, right here is Pacific Command, which is one of the keystones, one of the, one of the major bulwarks of the American Empire. The Pacific Command, in its own mind, has jurisdiction over half of the world. This includes China, Russia, Asia, most all of the Pacific, South America, Central America. This is a huge section of the human population that has nuclear missiles and nuclear weapons that are directed at them from Hawaii. If we were to enter into a third world war and if nuclear weapons are launched, there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever that Hawaii will be majorly target, targeted by America's enemies, specifically China and Russia directed at Hawaii because of American presence. But it's a significant number. And rest assured, there's no question that if there is a nuclear war and missiles are sent here, there will be so many missiles that there will be nothing left of Hawaii. 
The importance of the American war machinery in Hawaii is not only strategic. In reality, the economy of Hawaii depends a great deal on the United States military structure. According to the RAND Institute of Defense Studies, the military economy of Hawaii constitutes at least 18% of its gross domestic product, more than $12 billion a year. Military industrial complex is the number one economy uh, here in Hawaii, entity, uh, entity of our economy. Everybody thinks tourism is number one, but I believe that the military industrial complex is actually at the top, if not the two tied together. So that's what drives our economy. So it's very difficult to even have the discussion about withdrawing some of that military presence because our economy is so dependent upon it for so many people. The United States takes advantage of valleys, mountains and seas to use them as a training camp for its troops. At the same time, the United States offers its Hawaiians enclave for the training of foreign troops. The American military presence in Hawaii has caused serious damage to the environment of the islands. According to the Pacific Health Dialogue, there are 768 contaminated sites in Hawaii. This contamination is caused mainly by the deterioration of ammunition, the presence of mercury, lead, napalm, radioactive rubbish and radioactive fuels. In 2008, Colonel Howard Killian admitted that there was enriched uranium in Hawaii, but he argued that there was no danger for the population of the archipelago. Hawaiians are against the U.S. military presence because it goes against the desire to remain neutral. They demand independence and also the withdrawal of the military from the islands. The military abs absolutely needs to go. I mean, for one thing, it, it, uh, it compromises our neutrality. You know, we made it a point to stay out of the rest of the world's conflicts because, I mean, who has a problem with the, with the Hawaiians, for one thing? I mean, from my personal perspective, ideally what I think it should be is that Hawaii should be a neutral buffer zone between the Chinese power and, and the American power. The military buildup here is, is certainly something that's um, discussed a lot by many people. It's, it's almost become so normal, though, that I think some people don't realize how prominent the military is in Hawaii. Poverty, high living cost, cultural alienation and military threat are the direct result of the presence of the United States in Hawaii. Despite all of that, those Hawaiians who have decided to reclaim what was taken from their ancestors more than a century ago are not prepared to surrender. My efforts for being involved with this process of reinstatement is I'm trying to get back to being a lawful person. The law that you see here today is a charade. It's a, it's a big old Hollywood production. That's what is going on. And Hollywood does real well in fabricating identities and whatever else they do. I guess what it comes down to is, well, for me personally, having been aware of the of the wrongs that were perpetrated however like oh, well over a century ago part of it has to do with for me making sure that you know that the, the, the torch stays lit I think you're gonna get mixed feelings for sure but it's hard I think that as this movement grows 
there's going to there's going to be that shift and I hope instill some sort of hope of I can participate in something that is a gift to my generations to come and it can be it can be not in that space of anger I think we got the body in place we're going to demonstrate that we're real here in Hawaii and now we're going to take this realness to the world and let them know this is why we executing to reclaim what is rightfully ours which is sovereign authority and reclaiming our land, putting substance to our sovereignty process. Oh, I see it, uh, free, independent uh, uh, Hawaii uh, once again will be a reality because we're going to make that possible through law. And uh, the military, uh, the U.S. military can leave and just go back to North America and follow their rules, uh, exert their rules on their land. Remember all the stolen lands this old 